through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. All right, this is Spencer. And this is the MacGuffin, and I'm joined today by Allison Clayman, the director and a whole bunch of stuff, writer, producer, cinematographer <laughs> for the documentary Ai Weiwei, Never Sorry. And I have to get it on the table first that before I saw this film, I honestly don't know how much I knew about Ai Weiwei. I, I mean, I was familiar with, and I looked it up, was it Chen Guangzhen? Chen, the one, the blind lawyer that's been... Mm -hmm. uh, imprisoned at this point that Christian Bale, you know, tried to go see all that stuff. So I was, I was familiar, more familiar with stuff like that. But I mean, I was familiar with this kind of stuff happening in China. And that was one of the things that I thought was most interesting was that I was familiar with it in a general sense. But this film really sort of put a personal spin to that. What was your sort of thinking like when you decided to make this film, were you thinking about, you know, this much like him, that there, this is a topic that has to get out there and there really isn't anything talking about it? Or what, what were you coming into it thinking? No, I really think, and of course, you're always like trying to remember what you thought, you know, years ago right, before right, right, you right, knew right. what was going to come down the line. So as best that I've like tried to examine what I, what my thinking was back then, I really wanted to do kind of exactly what you just said, so I'm a little bit excited, was to do like a character study. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think because I also didn't come to the table mm. with a lot of pre-existing knowledge about Ai Weiwei or sort of any right. kind of I feel of a little bit slant. better then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so for me, the, one, the few things that were clear when I met him and I began filming with him actually for a short video project for an exhibition of mm. his in Beijing, and that was why I okay, met him. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was for me it was like the couple of things that were clear was like that i was very charismatic that um he's you know a figure who is gonna like shine a window <laughs> just, into a lot of just, things just to, just to clarify i is his name you're not speaking about yourself yeah exactly i and i so it's um yeah he's definitely a charismatic guy it's, it's it's no doubt about that and that was one of the things that was interesting because according to the synopsis of the film or what they talk about, at least on IMDb, it said you were Beijing-based at that point. Is that how you became aware of them? Exactly. I moved to China in 2006, or I went to China in 2006. I didn't know that I was moving there, but I ended up living there for four years. And it was only in 2008 when I both first really heard about Ai Weiwei and also met him and began mm. filming with him. Um, so for me, the, I was just excited by the prospect of making a movie where it was trying to really get to know a character that seemed worth getting to know and seemed like things were going to happen, but what those things were going to be was kind of anybody's guess. And, I mean, you were really serendipitous in terms of your timing of the, like when you started making this, because I guess what, 2008 was the Beijing, Beijing Olympics or China, China Olympics. Yeah, Beijing. Um, so that was right, I guess, towards like the peak mm. of his, uh, notoriety in terms of like you know designing the bird's nest for that stadium and there's like I mean, you, any of his exhibitions are getting worldwide acclaim but that was really front and center worldwide tv so you really got there right at sort of i guess the peak in terms of when he was getting or beginning of the peak when he was in terms of getting attention but you also happened to be there when everything just kind of went crazy exactly i mean i feel like that was something that was really important i wanted to show how things progressed mm. it, through the film because i think it's really easy when we're sitting here now to sort of imagine him as this like fully formed radical dissident figure when actually there was a great many years where he had this blog that was within the Chinese firewall, for example, and, you know, it wasn't shut down. It took, you know, four years for them to shut it down. There was a, you know, most of the time when he lived in his home, he did not have surveillance cameras on his door. I mean, these mm. things happened. Everything, he talks about it as kind of a chess game between him right. and kind of the authorities. And I really do see a lot of what's happened with him as a back and forth. The point is that he's an opponent who also doesn't back down. Which is, which is kind of amazing. There are, two, there are two things I want to quickly clarify because they occurred to me while I was watching this movie. Uh, number one, 
he has so much going on in terms of like, you know, the people who work with him, his projects that he's making. How exactly does that all get paid for? Because it seems like there's so many wheels in motion that, you know, it's good, it's good that he is an opponent that doesn't back down, but he happens to have, I wouldn't say an army working with him, but there's a lot of people and it was sort of, it helps that he's not just lost in the mix because of that. How exactly is that? Is that just from the art that he's able to do that or what? It seems like, you know, one of the, my favorite quotes that actually didn't make it into the film, his assistant in Cirque Young, who I did an interview with, who's like an art assistant at the studio since 2005, he described Ai Weiwei as a social system. He was like, if you think about it, he's got both the woodworkers, the porcelain works, the art assistants here in Beijing, the and then even further, the gallerists, the curators, you know, then he's got these volunteers. Like he's got so many, mm-hmm. there's so many people, yeah. his reach, it's almost like he he's like got his own like totally. corporation yeah. going on in itself. And the way what he said to me was that it really is that we are he's constantly putting he's reinvesting into the work, into the art and into the activism then as well. Mm-hmm. Um and I think it's a combination he does auction off um okay. his artworks. they they don't go for like the you know record breaking millions of dollars right. that Chinese contemporary art in terms of paintings usually go for because uh-huh. his stuff is a little more installation and furniture right. it's not, a little different. not exactly easy to yeah, put into it, your average home exactly it's not quite the same <laughs> he does have some photographs but also I mean when he has a big show like the Turbine Hall Commission at Tate Modern you know there's a budget for that I mm. think though he does put his own money into it to go further in order to kind of fulfill that vision well I mean it's, it's just amazing what he's able to mobilize essentially and that's sort of the other thing that you know you spoke about you know the restrictions of them shutting down the blog and stuff like that how exactly does he you know work around that like how can he even use twitter because the perception i have at least of i mean especially places like you know like north korea where it's essentially like a completely separated island from the rest of the world i kind of feel like that way at least in terms of you know films and stuff that we have that sort of go towards China, that it, it is so sort of separated from the, the rest of the world that how is he able to get to things like Twitter to spread his message? Because, I, I mean, in the film, clearly the Chinese, Chinese government is trying to shut that stuff down at any opportunity. So it's more like the Chinese government is so aware. It's like they have so much reverence for the Internet. Mm. That's why they need to control it so much. I think it's, first of all, we have to like talk about that fact. First, yeah. that it's like they are aware of the power and that that is why it's something that they, you know, feel like they need to control. But the truth is they still have a, a working internet with like hundreds of millions of internet users <laughs> for all the business development to happen there. I mean, right. they don't want it to be like sense, like yeah. have have no no internet. Um, but f- again, for Weiwei, it the I think the preferred um, situation would be to be able to exist within the firewall. The firewall is like sure. the sanctioned internet where China um, generally has the ability to shut off accounts, to delete posts, to kind of control content. Um, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, a lot of sites, um, because China doesn't have the ability to control them, exist outside the right. firewall. So that's how Weiwei's going on to Twitter. It's a very easy process of, you know, masking your IP address, using a VPN okay. and coming from a different, it looks gotcha. like your computer's in gotcha. a different country. But the main thing I think it's important to realize, I've realized as people have asked questions about this, like it's not illegal, you're not breaking the law to mm. go outside the firewall. I feel like that also shows what the the what China mostly cares about is what is swaying public opinion. And so if you're doing this stuff on Twitter, your reach is a lot more limited right. because the hundreds of millions of Chinese netizens are not all doing right. that, if right. that makes sense. And I mean, it makes perfect sense when you say it like that because there's the scenes where he's going to file the police report and he's like, look, if I don't, if I don't file it, we can't say that they ignored it. And that sort of mm-hmm. makes sense that he'd want to exist within the firewall because of that. Because, I mean, his whole thing seemed to be, you know, I want to change the system, but I'm not going to, like, start a riot or something to try and change it because that's that's just not going to be responded to well. And it's, it's amazing to me to think about because they t- you talk about, you know, subversion of the government is a crime. That is terrifying that anything that they feel like is attacking the government is a crime. Like, I mean, I, I don't even know how you could exist in that kind of 
world and not be terrified. Like if I were you, I would legi legitimately be terrified that at any moment, simply because you're working on this film, that it could be deemed, you know, subversive to the government. Well, I think part of it is also kind of working on recent precedent. And so for me, my my biggest concern was for the Chinese citizens that I was traveling with mm -hmm. or that w was working with, because they're the ones who are really at the risk of facing. And th that charge is incitement to subversion of state okay. power. Yeah. So that even can take you one step right, removed. Yeah. Like you could, you know, potentially be make, making people have a certain opinion to take a certain action. Basically, it's really important, though, to see that these charges are being brought against people who are like human rights uh, lawyers or just bloggers, people activists, are fighting writers. for people. Like then, it's not it's not like they're torturing people or something like that. These are people who are defending citizens. Exactly. The Nobel Peace Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo. Yeah. I mean, uh, the funny thing is, is that we part of putting these figures into the story initially in terms of editing the film was to help illuminate what is the risk that Weiwei is facing mm. um, because we didn't know what was going to happen last year that there was going to be a you know a three month long detention well I mean I guess that's a good a good point to talk about though you know I, I talked about being scared I guess was your thought that you know worst case scenario they'll just kick me out of the country or something like that were you actually at all legitimately scared that they could do something like that where they would just imprison you and nobody would know anything about what was going on again again that hadn't that is something that um, didn't feel like was really on the table in the sense that I was an accredited you know a, a working accredited journalist mm. who's also a white American if you looked at like the record in the past few years of, of foreign or foreign citizens even who have faced any kind of charges even if it's in the business realm or something like that they've also often been ethnically Chinese or mm. Chinese who you know got Australian citizenship or something like that but frankly I wasn't breaking any laws I mean I have the right to film anyone who was accepting an interview with me as a accredited journalist with a journalist visa um, and to kind of like make a point, recently in this last month, there was a big story about Melissa Chan, who is an American who was the Beijing correspondent for Al Jazeera English. And okay, she was yeah. just kicked out of the country. Uh -huh. They um, have refused to not only renew her visa, but to give any new visas to Al Jazeera English. So they had to shut down their bureau. But this was such a big news story because nothing like this had happened since the late 90s. And even mm -hmm. when that happened in the late 90s, nothing like that had happened even in a few years. So again, it really was such a rare occurrence that, again, I think that the risks for the Chinese citizens who are involved in these activities are far greater than the risks for the ones who are accredited foreign journalists who are documenting it. Well, I mean, there's, there's stuff like that, you know, I don't know how how strongly you have to know the law while this is all going on because there's scenes, you know, where he's like slapping the sunglasses off of like, I think it was a cop was who it was. Well, he never revealed his uh, identity or okay. badge number, but yes, it seemed like he was a... a but like, you know, that's, that sort of stuff feels like you're really sort of getting to that point of, you know, you know, I, I, I realize, you know, he, he wants to make his point and... I, I agree with where he's coming from, but it, it's sort of like, how close can you get to that line before, you know, they're going to really push back in a strong way? And it's it, it's it's kind of funny to think about in some ways, because at that point, he'd already been like assaulted in the head, had to have like surgery because of brain damage of some sort. It, it's it's funny to think about that's like after the fact, but how, how conscious were, you know, uh, who you filmed, what circumstances you filmed, how all that stuff, because like he didn't, he was clearly fighting back about, and there were other people fighting against being photos taken. So, like, how conscious of were you about the laws in terms of what you were doing and keeping yourself in safe territory? Well, that day was probably the scariest day of of filming that I experienced. It was always these trips to Chengdu where the mm -hmm. whole mission was to file complaints at the seats of authority at police stations, at courthouses. Um, but that day, most of the times when we, on those trips, we'd go from location to location, there'd be a discussion beforehand, okay, should Allison come out of the car or not? Should, or do you want to wait uh -huh. here? And so, for example, that's why that scene where things got sort of, that was like a, a physical kind of yeah. altercation that happened amongst a large group of yeah. people. Um, 
the I had the bird's eye view of that because mm. I was waiting in the car, gotcha. and and he um often brought Jiao Jiao with him and his you know who's his personal videographer, and he was like, look, uh, you're documenting events because most police uh, work right now they film everything that happens. Um, it's just kind of th- what's going on in terms of police work in China, mm-hmm. and so he would just be like, all right, well I'm gonna document it as well. I think like I always kind of wondered like if they knew that he was then going to immediately put it online. Right, which is kind of amazing to think about. Like I don't, I, I, and I could be completely misremembering what was being said, but at some point it seemed like he said he had made like ten to fifteen documentaries in like the last I don't know ten years or something. Like that is prolific in terms of stuff. I mean, there was the earthquake, at least one earthquake documentary that I remember. You know, there's was a documentary about his assault. Like there's so many things that it's kind of amazing how prolific he is in terms of just documenting stuff himself. Exactly. And it comes back to you said sort of like the army, the sort of the large like group mm. that he's got. And that's what's really amazing about the work he's doing and why I think he's kind of a symbol and that's why also to try to silence him is trying to send a message to a lot of other people because what he's doing is the way he's making all these documentaries is like when there's a flashpoint issue when something happens in China I focused on the earthquake but there are lots of sort of maybe um, smaller stories that became national news in China over the course of the last few years mm-hmm. where he'd send people out and say, go interview those people, you know? And it was like, because when you live in a society, I think where you are, um, where you know that the official media is only going to give you one story that even just the act to document it and to put it out there with practically without any commentary or without like any polish or finish, but like that is a subversive act in its totally. own and right. That, and that's, and that's sort of like, again, you know, where that like line of like subversion of the government or inc- inc- inciting subversion of the government this sort of so like wow that's that's pretty crazy one of the other things i had a question about was you know in terms of his sort of i don't know as i said you know the, the olympic thing seemed to be sort of like some sort of peak to me was that it seemed like before that i, I forget if it was like around 2003 or something i forget where the chronology was you know he came back to china after living in new york and it seemed like he was already sort of getting on their radar as being somebody who was sort of like working against, not, I, I hate to say working against, but sort of like his concerns were sort of a, fighting against what the government was saying in some ways. So I was kind of amazed that they brought him in as much as he was to work on the bird's nest at the Olympics. What exactly was the story there? Was was it sort of like a, an olive branch that they're trying to be like, look, come on, we're not so bad, you know, work with us, and then... So, I mean, yeah, he had come back from New York in 93, and really most of his activities were confined to within the art world. He was sort of like right. uh, dealing with antiques, like hanging out with like the burgeoning avant-garde scene and really mentoring them, trying to foster more communication between artists. It was around 2000... Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, he also began doing architecture, which really came because he designed his own studio mm-hmm. and it kind of became a big thing. He met Herzog and Demeron, the Swiss architects who designed the Olympic Stadium okay. um, in the early 2000s and was working with them because they were just like many architects, very interested in getting involved with projects mm. in China because it's the spot and things happen money, really yeah. quickly right there. Yeah. And so they really felt like they wanted to, he was kind of like a guide into like, what's China I like? See. He helped them with many projects and sort of uh, one of them being the competition to become the Olympic Stadium design. Uh, I don't know if I don't think it was I don't know if it was a blind competition, but I know that the entry was did not say Ai Weiwei. Gotcha, it was yeah. Herzog and Demeron. Gotcha. He was like a the consultant, like kind of China side involved in, in that design. So the fact that that design won, I don't think was even consciously accepting Ai Weiwei, and it certainly wasn't an invitation to right. Ai Weiwei to to do it. Um, I think then he kind of took that the fact though that he then took that opportunity to um, talk about what he thought and then it makes this headline that's like, you know, Olympic, yeah. you know, designer or co-designer, you know, speaking out against the games. It was really major because so many Chinese cultural figures were really taking that moment to participate in different ways, you know. And it, I mean, it didn't work out super great because they then made him tear down his studio that he built, yeah. which is really, really sad. But one of the other major things I want to talk about is that, you know, You made this documentary from 2008 to 2010, and then, I mean, obviously, I guess you had to leave at that point, but there's so much, like, postscript about him getting imprisoned, him disappearing, all this stuff that, how can you, how do you go about, you know, 
closing a book on a documentary when it seems like it's constantly evolving and existing still because he's such a popular topic. Well, one thing I knew from really early on when working on this project was that wherever it ended was not going to be because he ended. It was like very clear that his story was going to go on. What I think I was kind of hoping to do and that I wasn't necessarily planning on spending decades with him to right. like get to the end. <laughs> um, and what I was kind of hoping to do was to make awesome. the like... Um, in my mind, I was like, this will be the first really good look at Ai Weiwei because more stuff's going to happen, and and, oh, was, and that's kind of what I was aiming to I, do. I, I totally think you succeeded because <laughs> yeah. it really, I, as I said, like I had a very, very cursory knowledge of who he was and uh, generally the situation as well, and it really... It, I mean, by the end, I was just like, oh, God, how is this going to end? Is he going to be dead? Like, is this is, is this going to be? And and the thing that I really couldn't, that I didn't expect and couldn't have expected, though, was that actually this period of time, which, again, I was sort of like, well, this is the period where I happened to meet him, mm. and I'm going to end when I feel like I have enough for a movie. Um, but you're right. Immediately, I was like, oh, no, they're going to, like, tear down his Shanghai studio. I got to go back, you know. And then, obviously, when he was detained, besides it just being really traumatic on a lot of levels, I was like, well, this is going to be in the film too and filming the protests mm. and all these things um but it was really the fact that he was both detained and released in this in this period thankfully suddenly these last few years suddenly looked like not just a coincidence that i happened to be with him yeah. and i was like this is actually kind of a pretty important oh, totally. time it's in his life time man. and it kind of and the fact of the detention and the release i really think is kind of the cl close of this chapter, and we don't know yet what the next chapter is yeah, going to be. Yeah, like that, that's a scary thing, though. You know, it, 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 you think, it, I mean, it seems like a good place to close it because, I mean, he's seemed very, you know, it, I guess he was just finally starting to get back out of that shell of like, I don't want to talk about it. You know, they don't want me to talk about it. And sort of beginning to be, you know, vocal again. But, yeah, man, it's, just, it's one of those things that you just you can't help but wait for that other shoe to drop and something really go bad well and i just i just don't think that there's any way to know what's going to happen you know the year of these bail conditions that were imposed on him from his release that it comes up this year june 22nd and is he going to be granted more freedoms are they going to extend these mm. things how is he going to react to what they do for me i'm not sure that anybody in the world really knows the answer to what's going to happen you know i way way included and i think that you know part of what's also really great about bringing this film around is you know, that it has the chance of raising awareness should anything, you know, for totally. whatever happens next. Definitely definitely makes me curious about it all going forward. Um, I guess we should say, where can people find out more information about this film or anything on the subject that would be a good place to check out? Is there probably websites and stuff? Yeah, I mean, so our website is iweiweineversorry.com, but we're really active on Twitter, naturally, and on Facebook in terms also of getting the updates, even on Chen Guangcheng, the lawyer you talked yeah. about, we're sort of very current on a lot of the relevant news that's mm. coming out and especially what's going to happen with Weiwei this summer as well as all the ways that you can see the film because we have a theatrical release Fantastic. in the U.S. and in a lot of other places as well. Um, so um, our Twitter handle is A-W-W Never Sorry um, and for Facebook as well backslash A-W-W Never Sorry. Well, I'll be sure to put all that stuff down there. And in terms of you personally, is there anything else that you have coming up that you want to talk about or where can people find out more information about you? Um, you can, you know, find more information about me also on Twitter at Ali Clay um, and I have a website that's just my name Um and I'm definitely pretty busy getting this movie out right now but I have a bunch of projects in the works we'll see what can kind of happen maybe next maybe some like fictional narrative stuff might I know, be a, good, right? a, good a, little, a little too intense reality is sometimes so uh, thank you so much Allison for doing this and I wish you great luck with the film and I hope I hope more people see it because it definitely opened my eyes thank you so much Spencer and uh, check out more interviews at McGuffin podcast.com can't stop me I'm on fire tonight can't stop me I'm on fire tonight even can't stop me I'm on fire tonight don't even try to buy the can't stop me I'm on fire tonight the wrath of can't stop me I'm on fire tonight the board can't stop me I'm on fire tonight because I've got space game and it feels all